And look at what 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 to 31 says. Very interesting passage. Paul is addressing the Corinthian church. And uh, the early church was full of uh, people at the lowest level. They didn't have rich people. They didn't have powerful people. They had illiterate, semi-illiterate, broke people. They had weak people, slaves. They were not the highest level in the Roman Empire. And, and Paul looked at the church in Corinth and he sees them. They're houseboys, they're slaves, they, they, they are, they are small-time operators. They are, they, they don't, nobody knows them in the world. And he begins to talk to them about what God has done for them. And I want you to listen carefully to how Paul puts it and the language of it. He says, for you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. He says, look at yourself, look at yourself here. That in God's scheme, not many, now please note, it didn't say not any, but not many. In other words, some wise people will be called, some powerful people will be called, some noble people will be called, but when Paul is looking at them, he says, I don't see many of you like that. I, I see your calling that many of you are just ordinary people, not many wise according to the flesh. That means many of you haven't been to school, not many noble, you don't have a title, nobody knows you in society. Not many mighty, you have no power. People cheat you and oppress you and step on you. Verse 27, but, everybody say but. Okay, I may not be mighty, I may not be noble, I may not be smart, wise, but. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye, are you, in Christ Jesus, who became for us the wisdom of God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that as it is written he who glories let him glory in the lord but of him of him are you in christ who became for us the wisdom of god when we are in christ he becomes our wisdom he becomes the wisdom of god to us we who were nothing so in this passage, you see the kind of people God chooses. There are four kinds of people who chooses. I call them the four nothings. The four nothings that God chooses. Because Paul says, you are nothing. You are the things which be not. When you say something is not, it means that it's there but it's not there. The, the four nothings. And the first one is the foolish. The foolish. Those who are unsophisticated. God chooses us in our foolishness. He does not ask us to be wise before he chooses us. He picks us as we are, naive, foolish, childish, immature, lost. And he cleans us. And when Christ comes into, into our lives, he becomes our wisdom. And when God's grace comes into our lives, he uses the foolish to confound, to put to shame the wise. Wherever God picks you from, he elevates you from there. When God picks you as a foolish, he makes you wise in Christ. His grace overturns our weaknesses and our weaknesses become our strength. He chooses the foolish things to put to shame the wise. The second group that Paul says that God has chosen are the weak. Those who are powerless. They have no connection. Nobody knows them. In the days of Paul, not only were the people weak, but the church itself was weak. They didn't have 
any high and mighty members. They didn't have any big cathedrals. They didn't have any money. They didn't have any majestic rituals. They just met in people's homes, read the scriptures, prayed. And the Bible says God has chosen these weak things to overthrow the mighty. And the truth is, 300 years after Christ died, these weak people overran the Roman Empire. And the people who were there, who were strong, have been forgotten. But these weak people and the gospel they preach has endured for two centuries and for two millennia. And the whole world talks about them. God chose not the powerful to do powerful things, but he chose the weak to do mighty things. God is in the business of choosing the things which be not, the nobodies. He chooses a nobody, David, to overthrow a somebody, Goliath. The third group is the base. God chooses the base, those without honor. These are the people called the low lives. The people who are, we treat with least respect, we shout on them, we salt them, we don't allow them close to us. They are very low, but in Christ, they are high and lifted up. And the fourth group are the despised, those who are neglected. That is the wisdom of God. He chooses the nothings to replace the somethings. Because when you have wisdom in Christ, you are wiser than the greatest philosopher who doesn't know Christ. The scripture says, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? It's great. We admire people who have achieved much. They are great. They have great degrees. They have PhDs. They are professors. We admire people who have set up great companies. They have billions. We admire people whose lives have achieved much great footballers and sportsmen. But if they don't have Christ, they are nothing. The Christian who has Christ, who lives in the open and has no shelter on his head, is wiser than the professor who doesn't have Christ. Because the Bible says the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of man. I want you to imagine people living on an island. And the island, there is a warning that the island is going to be flooded. But people are sophisticated people. They have mansions. They have money. They have big cars. But they are living there. They don't care. They are just enjoying. And the flood start. And it's overrunning the, 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 the island. And the rich are there. And the sophisticated are there. And the, and the beautiful are there. And the handsome are there. And the celebrities are there. And everybody's there on the island. But they're not leaving the island. They're just there. And one poor nobody picks up an old boat and begins to move from the island under destruction to safety. Who is wiser? The man who got the boat or the wise, the mighty people on the island? Obviously, the, the one who is wiser is the one who escaped, the poor man. There are people who are living on this island called Earth. They have money, but they haven't taken the boat. The boat is called Jesus. And if you find him, you have found the escape route to life. Because pretty soon, your money, your wealth, your education, your name, your status, everything you have achieved will be nothing. And when everything is gone, the one who is redeemed and who escapes is the one who has life what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul it's great to achieve great things in life i admire great people sportsmen athletes musicians Great singers, great baritones, great voices, great orchestral conductors, great artists, 
great sculptors, business people. They've done much, but what shall it profit them if they gain all of that and didn't pick the boat? What's the value of everything you have if in the end you die and go to hell? He said, well, I wish I had known that would be too late. At that time, you can't quote any philosophy to anybody. It's absolutely nonsensical to live a wise, to live a good life here on earth for just 70 years and forfeit eternity. Endless time. That's the wisdom of God. Wisdom of God comes to us through Jesus. When God's wisdom comes to us, it is superior wisdom. And listen to how Jesus describes this wisdom in Luke chapter 11, verse 31. Jesus is talking about Solomon and his wisdom and comparing the wisdom of Solomon to his wisdom. And he talks about the queen of Sheba who came to look for Solomon and to seek wisdom. This is how Jesus put it. The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. Jesus is saying, people pay a lot of money for Solomon's wisdom. But a greater than Solomon, somebody bigger than Solomon is here. In the New King James Version, it uses a greater than Solomon, but that article, air, eh, in the original Greek, uh, it's not supposed to be air. Eh, it's, it's like something greater, something, not just air, eh, it's something greater. And I like how the new international version, the NIV, puts that verse. It says, the queen of the south will rise at the judgment of the people of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. But now something greater then Solomon is here. You think Solomon was wise? There is something greater than Solomon. You think Solomon was the smartest person? Oh, if I get the wisdom of Solomon, I'll be wise. There is something greater than Solomon. And that something greater is someone greater. And his name is Jesus. The wisdom of Christ is higher than Solomon's wisdom. The wisdom of Christ is higher. Solomon's wisdom was great, make no mistake. It was great wisdom. But his wisdom, as great as it was, did not stop him from acting foolishly to marry 700 wives and 300 concubines. Now, I don't know how you describe foolishness, but any man who manages to do that must be crazy. But here he's supposed to be the wisest man, but look at his actions. That's why Jesus says, a greater than Solomon is here. Solomon's wisdom was great, but Solomon's wisdom was not for him. When God appeared to Solomon and, 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 and asked, told Solomon, ask what you want. You know what Solomon asked for? He asked for wisdom, but what kind of wisdom did he ask for? He said, Lord, give me wisdom that I may lead this your people. In other words, I, I don't need wisdom for my life, but I need wisdom for my job. Professional wisdom, but not personal wisdom. So he succeeded professionally, but failed personally. And there are a lot of people with the Solomon wisdom. They are great on the job. They have great ability on the job. They excel on their job. They are good corporate leaders, but their personal life is a mess, a mess, and a mess. But they seem to be doing well. Professionally, we admire them. And many of us admire great people who are great professional film actors. Uh, some of them are political leaders. Some of them are even professionally in ministry are doing well, but their personal life is a mess. It's the wisdom of Solomon. But Jesus said, a greater 
than wisdom uh, Solomon is here. When I pray, I, don't, I never ask God, give me the wisdom of Solomon because I'm not ready to marry 700 people. Wives, how can I even remember their names? They bring a woman to you, they say, this, this is your uh, 547th wife. You say, huh? Where did you come from? <laughs> how are you going to remember their names? It's foolishness. And there are people, managing directors, they have achieved much. They are like Solomon, but their personal life is foolish. How can you have the, the mind to solve all these corporate problems, but you are being led around by little university girls? Who get broke? They get broke and say, oh, don't worry, I'm going, to, I'm going to go and deceive him and talk to him, and I'll just deceive him, and, 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 and you, you will see, you give me this. And they actually come and deceive you. <laughs> Mr. Solomon, they deceive you. <laughs> and you have a pot belly, and they tell, look, oh, I like your structure. <laughs> and then you two, you say, oh, yeah, I know, I know my structure is nice. Your pot belly is a structure. <laughs> they come and deceive you, collect your money, and then they go and tell their university classmates, 1920 girls, year old girls, say, Oh, I've gone to fool him. <laughs> but you make good boardroom decisions. You are good with your job. You are wise on the job, but your personal life is not. Jesus says a greater than Solomon. He said, when Jesus comes into our heart, he doesn't give us professional wisdom. He comes to live inside us and gives you wisdom to run your life first. It's something on the inside working on the outside. It's his spirit at work in you that is manifested outside. It's not just an external thing. It's eternal. A greater than Solomon is here the wisdom of christ is greater than higher than solomon's and not only that the kingdom of christ is greater than solomon's kingdom solomon's kingdom was built by forming alliances with other nations he did not grow his kingdom through conquest he grew his kingdom through compromise one of the reasons why Solomon had a 700 wives was because he had to sign contracts with all the nations and villages and towns around him so that nobody will attack him. And the way to sign the contract is to marry somebody from that village. His father, David, went into battle and won victories. His son, Solomon, compromised. So he became great, but he became great on compromise. Not on standing on principle. That's why the kingdom divided right after him. Because it was not a principled kingdom. When we come to the kingdom of God, we don't become great by compromise. You, you don't compromise principles. You don't compromise truth. You don't compromise what you stand for just to get along politically or corporately. Or in any area of your life, you have to know where you stand. That is what the kingdom of God is about. It's about standing on principle and doing the will of God, even when it costs you. But God came to the level of where we are with sinful man. And it was a product of the incarnation Thirdly, in Christ, God paid for the sin of mankind. God had to become man so he could pay for the sins of mankind by himself. Man could not pay for his own sin. It's like a person who is in a, in a big hole, can't get out. He's deep down there. There's no ladder, no rope to bring him out. And you look at him and you tell him, try to get out. He says, I, I'm doing my best. I can get out. For the sin of mankind. God had to become man so he could pay for the sins of mankind by himself. Man could not pay for his own sin. 
It's like a person who is in a, in a big hole, can't get out. He's deep down there. There's no ladder, no rope to bring him out. And you look at him and you tell him, try to get out. He says, I, I'm doing my best. I can get out. Then somebody jumps into the pit with him. Now that can be a good idea or a bad idea. If, if the person doesn't know how to get, get out, then it's a bad idea. There, there's two of them there. But what if the person who went down there knows how to get out? So in coming to the level of the one trapped, he now helps the one trapped to get out because he who went down knows how to come out. That is what the incarnation did. God came to our level not to settle with us, but to take us out together with Christ, out of the pit and into glory and into the kingdom. The incarnation made it possible that God paid for the sin of mankind. The story is told of a judge who was presiding of a case of a young man who has committed a crime. And after the case was adjudicated, the judge slapped a heavy fine on the young man. Because that's what the law said. The law says, if you committed this crime, that's the fine you must pay. And if you don't have the money to pay the fine, you go to jail. The young man is crying. He says, sir, I have, I have no money and I can't pay this fine. The judge says, then you go to jail according to the law. The law says, you'll be fined this. And if you don't have the money, you go to jail. Young man says, I have nobody. My parents are dead. I have no uncle. I, have no, I don't know where to go to get that money. He says, then you go to jail. He cries and cries for justice. But the judge says, according to the law, this is the fine, and you go to jail. So as judges started the process of reclaiming man back to himself, the challenge was how to do it legitimately and justly. Because Adam sinned with his wife Eve. They fell away from God. And God wants to bring them back. But he can't just bring them back. He has to do it legitimately and justly. There were problems with the plan of salvation. Because Adam who sinned and his wife Eve were human beings. He sinned as a human being. He sinned as a representative of the human race. And his sin brought the human race into sin. And as a result, all human beings had been made sinners. Now, if God was going to redeem mankind, he couldn't do it as God, a spirit. Because it, the sin was not committed by a spirit. He couldn't send an angel because an angel did not sin. So God had to do something about it. The Savior had to be a human being because a human being sinned. The Savior must not have sinned if he's going to be a Savior. Because if you're going to redeem man from sin, you couldn't be a sinner yourself. The, the person who is in the same problem with you can't deliver you from the problem. So... He has to be a human being, but he doesn't have a sin, be a sinner. How can he be a human being and not be a sinner? That is a paradox. Because it's the human nature in Adam that makes us sinful. But there has to be a human being who is not a sinner. Not only that, that human being who is not a sinner must die and shed his blood. And the person must defeat death and resurrect. It's a tall order. Which human being will qualify for that? So in the process of time, God devised a plan. The plan of salvation, which 1 Corinthians says was the wisdom of God. That if the devil had known about it, they would have left Jesus alone. That wisdom of God required a process 
which is called the incarnation. The incarnation. The incarnation simply means God becoming flesh or God becoming man. That word incarnation is originated from the Greek and it means in flesh or in body. It means something which is spiritual taking on physical form, incarnation. It is one of the most important truths of Christianity. It is the central truth of the plan of salvation that God became incarnate. God became flesh. And there are three verses of scripture I want to read which emphasize the incarnation. The first is Matthew chapter 20, verse 20, 20 chapter, ma, sorry, Matthew chapter 1, verse 20 to 23, John chapter 1, verse 14, and Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 to 8. Matthew 1, 20 to 23. And it reads, but while he thought about these things, that's Joseph, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take you to you, Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all the Lord through the prophet saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son and you shall call his name Emmanuel which is translated God with us Emmanuel which is translated God with us then John chapter 1 verse 14 and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Then Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 to 8, talking about Jesus, it says, Who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant, coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the, point, the death of the cross. The incarnation is the plan that Satan didn't understand. Satan knew that God was doing something. It was obvious that God was doing something because all of a sudden, Angel Gabriel is all over the place talking to people. So he, he figured God is about something. He didn't know what it was. Then he talks to Mary and says, Mary is going to have a child. The angel, Satan is figuring out what is all this about. And then he sees all kinds of things happening, but he has no clue what is about to happen. Because the Bible says if he had known that, he would have left Jesus alone. So what was it about the incarnation? First, through the incarnation in Christ, God became man. God became man. That's a very powerful thought. The creator of man became one of his creation. For God to save man from sin, he had to become one with man. God had to identify with man so man could identify with God. Becoming a man allowed God to take on the nature of those he wanted to redeem. It reunited God with man. In Christ, to our level. And not only that, in Christ through the incarnation, God lived with mankind. God lived with mankind. He had to experience the human condition. He lived where we live. He felt our pain. 
He felt the pressures of our temptation. He felt our sense of separation. He felt our need for redemption. God lived amongst men, experienced humanity. Emmanuel, God with us. Not God up above there. Not God removed from us. Not God who doesn't know us and care for us, but God who became us. That is the mystery of Christianity. That God is not way up there in heaven. Lord, amen. Well, I started teaching on wisdom uh, for some weeks now. And uh, it's been some long series. And this is the last part of my teaching on wisdom. And so this is part eight of wisdom. And today my focus is going to be on Christ as our source of wisdom. Christ our wisdom. We can get all the wisdom in the world. But if we don't have the true wisdom... We lose everything. And to this morning, I pray that you will have the number one most important thing in your life. Please turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6 to 8, and we read these words. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. It's a very interesting passage, especially verse 8. It says, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they knew, known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If the demonic world had known the wisdom of God, they would not have crucified Jesus. Because the crucifixion, the birth of Jesus, and the crucifixion of Jesus, and the resurrection of Jesus was a part of a divine strategy. It's a wisdom which Corinth, 1 Corinthians says was a hidden wisdom. It was a mystery. And something that the devil didn't know about and couldn't figure out. So what is this great wisdom that the rulers of this world did not know about? What was God doing so secretly that no one in the world could know about? The secret plan was a plan of salvation. Since the fall of man, God 